Welcome to the Airdrop Show. My name is Caleb. On the internet, I go by Phosphorus. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into the origins of the Bored Ape Yacht Club to see what takeaways and lessons we can learn from these NFT OGs. The first big project Yuga Labs put out was their infamous Bored Ape Yacht Club. After releasing these OG apes, they went on to release Bored Kennel Club, Mutant Apes, and even put out their own coin, ApeCoin. And now, they're building their metaverse project called Other Side. The current valuation of Yuga Labs is around $4 billion. That's billion with a B. But it didn't start out this way. Let's drop in and learn how the Bored Ape Yacht Club got started. The Board Ape Yacht Club started with Greg, who goes by Gargamo. Greg, Gargamo, Gar- whatever. Yeah. yeah, all good. And Wiley, who goes by Gordon. Board Ape Yacht Club in particular, but you know the rest of the things that we're doing at Yuga Labs really became an opportunity for me to um, build and help foster c- online communities that I thought you know would push the space forward, the communities that I myself would want to be a part of. Mm-hmm. The first time these two met was at a dive bar in Miami when they were both home on their break from college. They both had mutual friends who would frequent the same dive bar. This is where these two met. And in their first conversation, they got into a fight over books. I don't know. We just started talking and we just got in a fight about books, basically. Like I was studying writing. He was too. You know, he's got like fucking Kurt Vonnegut's face tattooed on his arm. So like clearly he's a novelist that we both liked. There was this like book that I was obsessed with at the time called Infinite Jest by a guy named David Foster Wallace, which is like a thousand pages and is like kind of cringy if you're like of a certain age and you're a man and you're like, that's my favorite book. And I immediately was like, you, oh, have you read that? And he's like, that guy sucks. And like, that was basically <laughs> Yeah, we just we like started, started fighting. Yeah. And then that was like the, the genesis of everything. It was like, oh. became like a sparring partner for ideas and creative stuff over the years. Just like texting about like, oh, what do you think about this or this short story? Or I'm working on this project. And then it was just somebody that you could be very frank with about like, that's a piece of shit, but maybe do this instead and whatever. And then it was just like a productive, creative relationship in that way. Their friendship grew. Arguing about books, movies, culture, ideas, and playing WoW online. I mean, so if we met eleven years ago, we we played like on like we played like World of Warcraft together as, as, as like soon as like a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, <laughs> like you know, like, like adults, late twenties, you know? like, like not cool, like you know, <laughs> just like just nerding out. In 2017, their conversations turned to crypto. They bought in during the bull run and lost it all in the bear. You know, I threw like a thousand dollars into like five different things but th- what was interesting then i think i feel like that that hadn't existed at least not for me previously knowing about crypto was like you just got into these communities on twitter and you would just you could read about 20 different cryptocurrencies all day and you just wanted to know more it was like this attention economy that was going on i don't know like and also it was just like a magical moment where like yeah we bought it at what eth at like 300 bucks and then went to like 1400 in like four months and it was just like this is crazy what is happening here and then the bear market hit and it, things got quiet, but like it just felt like something that we always wanted to kind of pay attention to. And but we were non technical people, so it was like, how do we like participate in this as like creatives or storytellers and that kind of thing? Yeah, like we were, we were like really obsessed a little bit with uh, crypto Twitter and like the personalities that would be on there. And like there was something really endearing about some of these guys or, or girls. It was like, you know, you could basically cryptographically verify that the person behind like that cat picture was worth, you know, maybe a hundred million dollars in crypto or something. And, you know, instead of like fucking off to the south of France, like most people in their 20s would if they made that much money very quickly, they were just like up at 2 a.m. being like, who wants to play league? You know, mm. like I'm bored. And that was like very odd to us. It was like, uh, I don't know, just interesting. He was more of like a long term investor. I tried to, I kind of took like a fish to water with like uh, trading and technical analysis, which I was like moderately okay with because I had some experience with that in penny stocks when I was in college. Mm. But, um, and uh, yeah, we kind of just rove that first wave 2017 which was our first wave all the way up and all the way down basically um and then kind of just kept twitter and the uh crypto in the back of our heads because we were like you know we can't contribute to this as tech guys because that's not really what we are we can't contribute to this really meaningfully as traders or investors because we're not that good at it but culture hadn't really come to ethereum we'd been exposed to nfts very early on in 2017 by via crypto punks and a project called crypto kitties and i remember that was my first nft was a crypto kitty um but it didn't seem to like really um, capture the attention beyond that bull cycle, you know, because it didn't like the, it felt a little dilutive. It wasn't there. It kind of had like the the feeling of an NFT blockchain game, but not really. It wasn't like fully fleshed out yet. 
they were, but both those projects were like pioneers, um, particularly CryptoPunks. Despite their interest in digital collectibles, Gargamo actually didn't buy his first non-fungible token until early 2021. And then it happened, which I'm sure it's the same feeling that's happened to all of us. We all start thinking, how do we do our own NFT project? So in February, Gargamo texted Gordon and said, hey, how do we do this? And they immediately started ideating. Obviously, we had the lockdown with COVID. I was working as a book editor at the time, you know, working 10, 12 hours a day as a senior editor at a book publisher and just wanted like, had this idea of like, I want to start my own thing, like not be relying on, on, you know, a paycheck kind of thing. And so for me, it was, it was more modest at the time. It was just like, let's just, I just want to make something. And I think I purposely went to, to Gordon for it though, because like, that's our dynamic is like, I think like what's achievable, what can we do? Like how do like, I, I was a book editor and a poet. I always want to make things like simple and like bold. And he's like, I want to make it fucking crazy and take over the world. And we meet somewhere in the middle. My backstory was I was, um, I got really sick in college. I have a, an autoimmune disease called colitis. And I was like, basically bed to bathroom for 10 years, like really, really ill, uh, lost 10 years of my life. And I had kind of started to basically miraculously recover through the help of uh, Western and Eastern medicine. Um, probably a couple months before Garga texted me, let's make an NFT. That was like literally what he said, let's make an NFT. Um, and so I don't know if you quite realized just how much fire had been building up for me for 10 years. And so, yeah, I came into this thinking, I want to build something extraordinary. You know, I don't just want to like, you know, um, do just something do for, for just fun. a brief moment. It wasn't just for fun for me. I was thinking like, okay, I want to make my mark on the world a little bit. And I want to, and I was also obsessed with online communities. You know, like, you know, when you're sick for 10 years, you know, it's like in your twenties, you know, it's like, a you don't really have a real life outside of your digital life. That's you know? why we just yeah. play World of Warcraft. That's why we play <laughs> World of Warcraft. Or that's why I got into crypto because it was like something I could do from bed, basically. Um, I also played, played a ton of video games outside of World of Warcraft. I was on Twitch. I was on YouTube, you know, just like being a part of online communities on Discord. Just like that was my home, you know? That was like my version of the metaverse, you know? It was the way I could experience reality and not feel bad, basically, about myself. One of those crazy ideas was to do a communal digital canvas, which anyone could write on. That was their utility. Wiley shared this idea with his longtime friend, Nicole Munez, who is now CEO of Yuga. She accurately predicted what most people would draw on this communal digital canvas were penises. <laughs> so the guys ran with the idea and started asking questions. Question, where's the most likely spot for someone to draw a penis? Answer, on the bathroom wall of some dive bar. Question, what kind of people go there? Answer, the kind of people they both knew from crypto Twitter, who had gotten rich off crypto but still prefer playing WoW than living like lavish millionaires. So Gordon spent all night crafting and mapping out this giant essay to which he sent to Gargamo. The name Board Ape Yacht Club first appeared within this document. The concept worked like this. There were these crypto millionaires, but instead of people, they were actual apes. You see, in crypto, the term aping in means compulsively investing in a new project without doing much research. The next day, the two filed for an LLC. The problem was, neither of them were artists and neither of them were developers. Gargamo worked in publishing and Gordon didn't have a job. So they hired a team to execute on the idea. Their longtime friend, Munez, was a founder of a branding consulting agency. And she introduced them to a visual artist known as Seneca. Seneca worked on the initial Board Ape Yacht Club concept art, and the only directions he was given were bedraggled punk rock and dive bar in the Everglades. When Seneca was first contacted about drawing the Board Apes, she was not familiar with NFTs. The ape body, though, is an exact line-for-line -line drawing of Seneca's original drawings. Other production artists came in and handled certain traits and environments. A total of four other artists helped design the initial 10,000 apes. So while the apes were being drawn up, Gargamo was on the move to get in touch with some developers. So he asked some old friends, Zishan, who goes by Sass, and Kareem, who goes by Emperor Tomato Ketchup. Gargamo asked them if they knew JavaScript, which, ironically, is not a relevant coding language for blockchains. The technical duo quickly learned the right language, which is Solidity. Emperor Tomato Ketchup says that learning Solidity was the easy part because the non-fungible ERC-721 token was easy and standard and had been public for a really long time. 
therefore it was easy enough to use as a boilerplate. The complex part came to managing the project's multiple components, the website, the smart contracts, the token-gated community spaces, and stringing them all together. Somehow, they made it work. They had a pre-sale and a mint that launched on April 23rd, 2021. We had a pre-sale that lasted a week, and again, as Gargo was saying, it basically um, flopped kind of flopped yeah it was like 400 sold you know we did everything we could to promote it as much as possible 400 in a week yeah or 500 which but the thing is back then you either sold out like immediately or you kind of never did is what the feeling was so you know it wasn't like 400 in a week oh we did it It was like oh this might never happen and so you got kind of despondent i was i was like shit we you know and i call you like really angry (laughs) no we gotta go we gotta go you're ready to quit I wasn't ready to quit. I was just like, fuck, like, what's happening? This was after like three months of nonstop, oh, like, shit. you know, working on this. And, you know, some of the early community members um, in particular were just so amazingly helpful. Um, there's two in particular, or three in particular that I recall that, you know, they had, you know, they knew some people in crypto and they, you know, they, they saw the vision for what we were trying to build here and they, you know, hesitantly, you know, believed in what we were trying to do. And so they would reach out to people. And that, I think, moved the needle a little bit. Mm-hmm. But it really wasn't until... Yeah, what was the turning point? The yeah. apes revealed, right? So pre-sale, you didn't get to see what you had. Right. It was kind of like you, that, you that owned moment. one, but it was like, you didn't know which one it was. You couldn't empathize with it yet. It was just like, you owned one of 10,000 apes. You didn't know, like, yo, it's this guy. Actually. Right, right. And some, yeah. somehow that, that little magic part of, like, you know, basically, like, cracking it open and saying, like, oh, that one's mine and people can identify with that. How it's long like the, was that though between the reveal, the purchase and the reveal? It was just a week there. A week and then the reveal, they sold out within like I think four or six hours. Yeah, once they were revealed, it was flying off. A madhouse. Oh, like, yeah. we, we flipped Uniswap at the time, which was like to us mind blowing. Oh, yeah, um, that's awesome. And on the evening of April 30th, the foursome revealed the apes, which went for $200 a pop and they went to bed. Around three in the morning after the reveal, Sass got a call from Emperor Tomato Ketchup, and together they watched the collection sell out. Somehow, the word had spread through a very zealous NFT community, and this is the moment they knew they had caught lightning in a bottle. The Board Ape Yacht Club has since solidified their name in the NFT space by throwing some of the biggest parties around. Several celebrities have aped into the project, and the Board Ape Yacht Club has continued to release derivative projects like Mutant Apes and the Board Ape Kennel Club. Their big thing is working on an interoperable metaverse experience, which they call Other Side. However, it's going to be several years before Other Side works the way they dreamed it up. The Yuga team has massive dreams and ambitions for the space, and the whole world is for sure watching them. What the Board Ape Yacht Club did really well was the use of their CC0 license, which means the owners of the NFTs could make money off the intellectual property of their Board Apes. This worked as a marketing tactic, as more and more people used the board apes for certain things. They made restaurants with them, they put them on liquor containers, and made alcohol with them. So the board ape name would continue to show up over and over and over again. Eminem and Snoop Dogg even made a song using their board apes. This plan, this structure, this roadmap of create a project, make it CC0, release a derivative project, continue another derivative project, has become the Yuga playbook and has been used by most NFT projects during this bull run of 2021. We don't know if this playbook will work all the time, but it is worth noting that they just continue to make quote-unquote cool shit, and that drove up the price. Final thoughts. Who really knows if the guys who came up with Board Ape are geniuses or just had really good timing? The market was primed for something like this. Plus, Board Ape was different enough than everything else out there, and the founders were deep enough into crypto Twitter to cause a big stir when the apes eventually got revealed. At first, the only utility the Board Apes had was they were able to draw on a virtual wall, and everything was thrown together at the last minute. What they did really well was storytelling. These apes were rich monkeys who were lazy and bored because they've won the game of crypto. This was a story that anybody in crypto Twitter wanted to be a part of. They wanted to see themselves as lazy monkeys who hit it big at the right time. These apes would spend their time at dive bars, smoking cigars, and making crude jokes, and going to massive parties. This is, of course, not financial advice, but I do think that board apes will have some value in the future. Just because of this story. They were one of the first. Regardless how other side and their metaverse game does, holding an ape means holding some part of NFT history. So when thinking about doing this, you really need to nail down the story that you're telling. Can people buy into this narrative and see themselves as part of this narrative? 
My sources for this story are the Input Magazine interview with Greg and Wiley, as well as the Rolling Stone features on Seneca, the artist of the Board Ape Yacht Club, and the Full Send podcast. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe if you want to hear more of these deep dives. Follow us on Twitter at Airdrop Show, and I'll see you next time. This is Phosphorus signing off. Thanks for dropping in. Mm-hmm.